All right, we're going to be in 2 Peter this morning. I'm going to do something a little different than we normally do. I think I'm going to read this whole chapter. 2 Peter chapter 1. Just bear with me. I'm going to be in the ESV version. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Christ for, for we did not follow, verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation no. for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you this morning that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would use me as a mouthpiece, Lord, that you would use me as a vessel to speak forth your truth to your people, Lord, that what would be spoken this morning is your heart and your will, Lord, and that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, through into the people's hearts, Lord God, into my own heart, Lord, as we as we discover more depths of your truth, Lord God, that you would do a work in us, in our lives, Lord, as we unveil Jesus, Lord God, in this midst, Lord God, that you, Holy Spirit, would witness to it, that you give us divine understanding and revelation, and we just pray this in your glorious name, amen. amen. <laughs> so I titled this morning's message, His Divine Glory. I wanna, I'm going to work backwards uh, a little bit, and I want to just 
maybe start in the middle, kind of go down, and then go back up. So, so Peter says this. He says that I'm about to put off this body. The, the, the Lord has revealed to me that um, my, my time of departure is imminent. Jesus had revealed to Peter that his life on earth wasn't going to last very much longer. Okay, and now he was mar he, he died the martyr's death. The, according to church tradition, he was imprisoned along with the apostle Paul in the Mamertine prison in Rome. But and that he died a death where he was crucified upside down. And so, at some point in time, maybe a year or two before he died, the Holy Spirit put it on his heart to write this second letter. Now, this letter was written in reference to the fact that in the Christian world. There was a lot of heresy going on, a lot of false teaching, a, a lot of uh, twisting of the truth about Jesus. And it was causing a lot of confusion in the church. And much of it had to do with Gnosticism. I don't want to get into that too much, but it was like almost like, well, they were engaging and mixing mystery religions with with Christianity. And, and believe it or not. A lot of that type of stuff is actually happening today. And, and so Peter's writing this letter to bring correction so that people like you and people like me and people like them back then would, would have the truth and would be able to hold on to, to, to Jesus. Amen. And so he said, listen, as long as I'm in this body, though, i got to stir you up. Yeah. I want to stir you up and bring to your remembrance some very important things. And what he said was this. He said, we were with him on the mountain. Amen. We were there whenever the divine glory that was in him showed out of him. We were there whenever the voice from heaven spoke and said, this is my son in him. I am well pleased. I really like the way he, the Holy Spirit worded it through. He said, we did not report to you cleverly devised fables. We didn't come up with some kind of storyline. Right. He actually said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and I got to tell you that, to me, that's very powerful. That, and I think that we have, to, we have to understand a couple of things. Number one, what we believe is based in large part on eyewitness yeah, accounts. Right. Amen. That's right. If you have truly been saved, then you've also had a witness in your heart. Amen. 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 The witness of the Holy Spirit has moved into your heart. But before you ever received Christ as your Lord and Savior, somebody that had witnessed Jesus, told witness to you about Jesus. And at some point in time, you said, yes, I need Jesus. And then when you did, you received the witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart. If you haven't received the witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart, then I have to tell you you're not converted. Amen. I have to tell you that you're not born again, but I got good news. You just got to call on his name and you just got to need business with him. And when you do, hallelujah, something will happen to your heart. Amen. And the Holy Spirit will move in. What does that mean? It means you got to, first of all, you got to realize you need it. That's right. You got to realize you need a Savior. That's right. You know, Listen, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but and, and I don't I'm believing that this isn't gonna be this time around when he wins the presidency. But last time I'm just gonna be real with you. He said I, I saw an interview, I saw it with my own eyes and I heard it with my own ears. And they asked him, he said, he said, Did you ever but did you ever repent? He said, Well, I don't what's that? Say did you ever say you're sorry? You know, I don't I don't think I don't remember anything that I did that I need to say I'm sorry for. You know, when it comes to your relationship with God <laughs> You're going to have to repent and you're going to have to say that you're sorry for offending God. Amen. For and for going against his word. And, and you're going to. And, and the only way that someone will do that is if they come to the realization that they did offend God and that they did go against his word. But the good news of the gospel is, is that when your heart is convicted and you feel that conviction and you repent. Amen. Then, then, and you and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior from your heart, and you confess 
that, G that God raised him from the dead with your mouth, amen, that, that he moves in. The Holy Spirit moves in. Forgiveness takes place. The burden is lifted. Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about because, look, you can be going through some really rough times in your life. But when, but, but when the Lord's there, that burden is lifted and there can be peace even in the midst of chaotic situations. Amen. And so... You know, Peter's like, man, I got to stir you up. And I got to tell you that I was an eyewitness. We were eyewitnesses. We saw this. And then the reason I'm bringing that up is I had a conversation with a person that's, you know, pretty prominent in my life and has been for many years in the workplace and very intellectual. And we started to have this conversation. And I started to realize I was sharing with Danielle this morning, you know, that conversation I had with him, he was basing his report off of an eyewitness account of an author that he's reading. Mm -hmm. A person that's maybe an archaeologist. And, and he believes in that person because they have an education and he feels like they don't have a, a dog in the hunt. So he feels like he can believe their report. But the report that that person was speaking was contrary to the, to the scripture. Amen. Yeah. And, but yet he's willing to believe the eyewitness account of this, you know, author, this archaeologist, this trained professional, and what he's saying that contradicts the word of God. And, but, and, and he chooses to believe that instead of believing the scripture because, you know, they found uh, during this time they were growing cereal instead of this. And so, you know, it, this proves no. It doesn't, it, we either believe the word of God or we don't. And amen, the people of God have to choose to believe the witness of the scripture. And when you believe the witness of the scripture and you receive Christ in your heart, you get a witness in your heart. Amen. And so he wanted us to know that, um, that because of him witnessing the majesty and the divine glory of God coming out of him on that day. That's basically what happened. The deity that was in Jesus, because you understand he never stopped being God, but he became man. Amen. Because, see, it wasn't God that had offended himself. It was man that had offended God. So God had to become man in order to make right the division that had taken place. And so God became man in his son, Jesus. Amen. And, and Jesus uh, died on the cross. But on that day, his, his deity shone out of him. Amen. And he said, we saw, we saw his majesty. He said, this confirms the word of prophecy. He said, we have an even greater confirmation of the prophetic words that were spoken through all of those years because we saw the divine glory on that mountain and we're and I'm, we're just here to tell you what we saw and what we experienced and that you you can believe it and he said and this word of prophecy is like a light that is shining in the midst of darkness and and, and he said i want you to be able to believe this until the day star rises in your heart hmm. has the day star risen in your heart yet amen what are you even talking about, preacher? I'm talking about when you truly get born again and the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, it's like light dawns on the inside of who you are. Amen? And whenever you truly get born again and you will move towards the things of God instead of the things of the world, the things of God, the light of God will begin to grow on the inside of your heart. A hunger for the things of God will begin to grow on the inside of your heart. Amen? And so I just wanted to kind of share that with you uh, about that. And um, going back to the beginning, he, cause he, and, I, and I, wanted to, I wanted to explain that in one of the main verses that I was going to talk to you about is that he says, this is really what the essence of my message is about. I may have to do it in two, but where he says to add to your faith and he says virtue and knowledge and and I wanted, I wanted to say that it's very important that we understand that you can't add anything to your faith for a righteousness purpose does that make sense like in other words Jesus is the righteousness of God and 
And, and God sent forth his son and, and on the cross there was an exchange that took place. Amen. And, and Jesus took your sin. He took my sin on him on the cross. And when we put faith in that, there's an exchange where he takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. And so you can't add to and you can't try to earn righteousness with God through the things that you do. Scholars, it, it, the whole book of Galatians was written about that. They call that Galatianism. It is a, it's a form of legalism and it becomes a performance based Christianity. Your faith, if you don't, if you're not aware of it, it shifts from what Jesus did and his performance for you to what you do. And when you do that, that's actually where it's talking about in Galatians 2 and 21, where you begin to frustrate the grace of God. Because you're adding to what Jesus did in order to think that you're going, that like, in other words, if you're not doing well with the Lord. Okay, it has been, I know we've all been there. And we're not doing well with the Lord and we feel the struggle and we feel like I have to do something in order to get my life to get things right, okay. I've been, I know I've been there before, and I can remember. I used to see people in Walmart, you know, when I, you know, like, where you been? Oh man, I need to get back in church, right? I used to say this all the time. I haven't said it in five years. That I, I need to get back in church. Well, yeah, you do. You need to be in the house of God. Praise God. And I need to get back in my Word. Praise God. You should have never got out of your Word, okay. Well, I, I need to spend more time in prayer. You can't pray enough. But none, the the time you spend in prayer. However many times you go to church, how much time you spend reading the word of God, none of those activities make you righteous in the eyes of God. Jesus, righteousness has a name, Romans 3.21. His name is Jesus. And when he died on the cross and you believed in that, an exchange was taken place and you've now been clothed in his righteousness. That's what's called justification by faith. It's important that you understand that. I sat in a full gospel church for 12 years and never even heard what that was. Justification by faith means you have been declared legally righteous by the voice of the Father because you believed in the plan that he sent his son, the righteous one, to die for your sin. Amen. No, that's good. You know why it's good? Because it, it can lift the burden off of you. It can lift the condemnation off yeah. of you. It can lift the condemnation off the preacher. Because there ain't nobody in this house that's done it all right. But hallelujah, it will just get our heart right with him. Yeah. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Got to get our heart right with him. Yeah. Amen. And when we get our heart right with him, we're right back in that right spot. But what he says is, Add to your faith is what the King James Version says. ESV says, make every effort to supplement to your faith. Yes. Amen. One Greek scholar said, to provide beyond the need, to supply more than generously. Now, I need you to understand something. What that's saying is, is that you have a part in this. Now, we're going to get into this here in a second because we're talking about faith. He said, Supplement your faith, and, and I need you to understand that this means that you have activity. This means you are purposefully engaging in action. This means that your thoughts are aware of what the Word of God says. Your thoughts and your heart are aware of what God desires from you. And now through the power of the Holy Spirit that has worked in you, you are partnered purposely partnering with the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish God's will that he has for you and he has for me. Amen. So if we go back to verse one of uh, verse one of the of first of second Peter chapter one, I thought that this was really interesting right here where he says this, this word in, he says, I'm writing, basically saying, this is my name, and I'm writing to those of you who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. <laughs> Isn't that, 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 does that ever, that, have you ever noticed that before? It kind of really stuck out to me this time. I was like, what are, you, what are you saying? You got some kind of a special faith? Are you saying that 
and then and, and, and now I would have always thought that you had a special faith because you're Peter and um, you're Peter and 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 you know so, and you're one of the apostles mm -hmm. and so I would have thought that you had a special faith but now but now and so in the past I would have said you mean I can be a, an equal standing with you you know, how, how does that happen so two things I want you to know is is that no man is elevated above another man that's right. Amen. Okay. But I will tell you this. He is making a distinction and he is saying this. He said, I think what he's saying, what he's, I don't think I know. He's saying not everybody has obtained the same faith as us yeah. because he's, remember, he's combating heresy. Yes. He's combating lies. Now, it's not your job, nor is it my job to try to determine Who's really in and who's really out? That's not what I'm suggesting here. Amen? Amen? But what I am suggesting is that there are some people who are truly in and there are some people who think that they're in. Amen. And the reason that people oftentimes think that they're in when they're really not in is because they have been under heretical teaching. Amen. They've been taught that, you know, certain things in certain ways. I, don't, I can't. There's so many different things that we could go through that we don't have any time. We don't have the time to get through that. But I want you to see he's saying about a specific faith. And what and I will say it like this, that the word faith can be used either as a verb or a noun. And I'm not trying to get so technical that I lose you. But I want you to understand that believing or faith. I've heard somebody in the past say fading. Are you fading? Do you, so it requires the verb of faith because to have faith is to believe from the heart, to believe. Amen. And so that's an action. Like, I may not be grabbing something, but no, in a sense, I am spiritually. I'm grabbing it. I'm grabbing it by faith. I'm grabbing the truth of God's word by faith. Amen. And so, so there's a verb of faith, but then there's a noun of faith. Now, listen to me. Well, that's whenever I draw the little thing on the board, right? Uh, whenever, whenever I draw the thing on the board, and there's a couple of different ways I do it, but we'll just say that you're in the world. And here you are, born of Adam in the world, right? We've done that before. And here is Christ, okay? And we'll just put it, get, give him his good crown right there, amen? And, and so, you, so the gospel went forward, and what did you do? You you believe. Yeah. Yes. Amen. And when you and so you believed in a verb sense. You heard and you believed. So you responded to truth, and whenever that happened, the Holy Spirit did a work and he put you in Christ. Right. And so now you're in the faith. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? So this is a verb believing. Put you in a place, yes. a person, place, or thing. And now you're in the faith. And that makes you part of the ecclesia, the chosen out one. Chosen out of what? Chosen out of the world and placed into his marvelous light. Transferred from darkness and into the light. You have a new position now. You have a new home. You're in the faith. If you're truly born again, you're in the faith. Amen? Amen. And so he says, look, I'm trying to write to you people that, uh, that have an equal standing of faith is what we do. So there's a real place of faith. I think I got the point across. I hope, yes. you, I hope you're with me on that. Amen? But now he's saying, I need you to, I need you to add to your faith. Praise God. The NASB version says this, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. I think, I mean, that's really something to ponder. I'm a preacher that likes to try to make people think. I've got to get used to people being quiet because I want people to think, and you can't, you can't think and shout all at the same time. So I'm okay with that. We're going to get quiet. But listen. The NASB says this, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Now, we're going to try to get into this story here. We're going to try to determine what does that mean? What does that look like to have a faith the same kind as theirs? Now, what he told us about Jesus is that the glory of Jesus came out of Jesus. 
And I got to tell you that in a simplified version, that's what a faith that is the same as theirs ought look like. It ought to look like the glory that is in you, amen, coming out of you. It's a whole new life, amen. The faith that they were born into was a life-changing, new creation faith that with time and correction led to a life where their will was swallowed up in the Master's will, where they died and Christ lived through them, where they overcame Satan through the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own lives even unto death. That's what their faith looked like. It didn't look like I just... I just come to church on Sunday and I'm not, I, I, or I don't come to church on Sunday and Wednesday, but then I do what I live my life the way that I want to live my life Monday through Saturday. That's not the kind of faith that Peter signed up for. Come on, church, help me out here. You want real, we want real biblical Christianity or do we want a different version? Amen? No, because, see, we don't want to waste our time sitting in church if we don't really believe the Bible. So if we believe the Bible, we want to understand, what, is, what am I in here? What am I doing? What am I in? What does the Word of God say? What does the Lord expect from me? Come on. God expects that you and I will yield to Him and allow Him to have His way in us. Yes. Amen. 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 So, so look at, but look, I want you to see verse three of First Peter chapter, Second Peter chapter one. I want, and it says this: His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. I want you to, I want you to see this. It says His divine power. The King James Version says, has given to you his divine, his dunamis, yes. his miracle working, explosive, heavenly power that shows up and changes things according to the word of God has given to you all things that pertain to life yes, yes. and godliness. Yes. See, we're getting, when we get into the to these words that he, that Peter was telling us about virtue and knowledge and brotherly affection and all of these things, what we need to understand is this: is that you can't do any of that without Amen. the dunamis yeah. of God. Amen. But what the Word of God says is that the dunamis has been given to you. Yeah. The power of God has been given to you. Amen. Let's take a look real quick at, at how this happens. Let's look at uh, Colossians um, chapter 3, verse 10. Colossians, and I'm in the King James now, or I can just, I can just read it. You don't, you don't have to turn to it. Or you can even leave that one up there. Just do that, and I'll read it to you out of the King James, and y'all can read it in the ESV. I'm going to go up to 9, sorry, because it talks about the old man. In verse 9, it says, don't lie to one another. All right, so look, some of you, you're like, well, I don't lie, preacher. Okay, well, praise God. That's not your thing. <laughs> Amen, good for that. But whatever you used to do, Come on. that's what he's getting. Okay? He's saying, don't lie to one another or put in the blank whatever it was you used to do. See, why, why are you telling me that? Because you put off the old man and his deeds. Yes. See there? I put off the old man and his deeds, verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Yes. Now, I want to spend just a second here on this word knowledge, okay? Because there's two words in the text that we're studying, and one of them is this word here, gnosis. Okay, this word shows up in the text of 2 Peter chapter 1 twice, and then there's this other word, and it, and, and it has this word in front of it, epi. So it's epignosis, okay? This word that we're looking at right here is epignosis. Now, I just, you don't have to memorize this. I'm just trying to make a point. Gnosis describes informational knowledge, okay? In order to understand the things of God, you're going to have to put information about God in your mind, in your heart, all right, but epignosis describes a more full understanding, a, 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 and it has an added experiential aspect to it. Okay, if I was going to try to give you an illustration, 
I would say, and I've used this illustration before, don't get confused with these big words because I'm going to explain it. When I was in nursing school, they said you got to take the didactics first and then the practical. All didactics meant was book learning. Okay? You got to learn the stuff in the book and then you got to take the stuff you learn in the book and go do it practically. You got to go now into the hospital and you got to put an IV in somebody. You got to hang a bag of IV. If you're an electrician, you learn how to read the little diagrams or whatever, power on, all this stuff. Then you actually got to go out to the field. And a lot of times as an electrician, I've heard you probably get shocked a couple of times, right? You might get... Oh, wow. Remind, note to self, don't do that again, right? And, 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 even, and as a nurse, i got to be honest with you, that's what I call it practicing. You make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes, right? And, and as a Christian, I need you to understand, there's one thing to read the truths of the Word of God, and then it's a whole different level when you try to take the truth and you begin to walk the journey, right? And then you run into some brick walls and you fall into some yeah. ditches yeah. and some different things happen in your life, yeah. right? But the Lord is saying that if you'll hold on to me and trust me, then guess what? I'm going to turn these experiences yeah. that, you're, that you're going through into a different kind of knowledge. It's, a, it's experiential knowledge and it's going to bring you to a deeper level of a walk with him. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. So... And how it happened was, was that you put on the new man yes. and you were renewed in the experiential knowledge. You, you see, he did, you were regened. That's what it says in Titus chapter three, verse five. You've been regenerated. Yeah. And one easy way to say it is like you, you got regened. He, he, he gave you new genes. Mm. When you were born of Adam, Lord. you were born in the image and likeness of Adam. Yeah. You were born in, in sin. You receive the sinful nature. But when you're born again in Christ, hallelujah, and that brings us to the next verse, you have now become a partaker. Let's look at verse 4 of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. So, so through this new life and this new godliness, uh, you know what? I'm sorry. Oh, let's go to Ezekiel first. I want to talk to you just a little bit longer about this new man. And a little bit longer about how you received the divine power and a little bit longer about how for you to understand that he's already get, he's already equipped you. I want you to understand that this morning. Yeah. He's already he's already equipped you with what you need for godly. That's what the word of God says. The word of God says you've already received and been equipped with what you need for godliness. Yeah. Amen. And, and life. Yeah. You've already, you already have it. The, the problem that we have as believers is that either, number one, we didn't know it, number two, we don't believe it, or number three, it's just informational knowledge and we're in the process of it becoming experience. Yeah, Does that yeah, make yeah. sense? Okay, so again, I started this message off by saying some of you in here, the enemy might be trying to hold you under condemnation and guilt, but I'm here to speak to you this morning yeah. that your father loves you. Amen. And that he's not going to quit on you. Yeah. And so you don't quit on him. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And, and so uh, in verse 4, I'm sorry, in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse uh, Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. There we go. Let's just read it off. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. Hallelujah. Now I want you to know. That right there, that's talking about the, that's right there is talking to many of you in the church already know this. That right there is the water of purification. Yes. And what it's describing is the, is the ceremonial cleansing of the ashes of the red heifer. Right. Yes. Okay. And what are you talking about? Well, you got to understand the waters of purification, they would burn that whole red heifer, and we don't have time to get yes. into all that, with the blood and everything in it. Yes. So, and they burn it down to the ashes. And I don't know how much ashes you get out of one red heifer, but there's, I can't remember the number because I was reading the Temple Institute the other day. I think that there's been a total of 10 since the advent of the nation of Israel, and they got three more ready to go, but they hadn't killed none of them yet, right? But it's been 2,000 years since they've had ashes from a red heifer, okay? And they have to use the ashes of the red heifer for purification before they can ever really rebuild the temple. 
This is my understanding. Because, you see, these waters of purification are for the purposes of ceremonial cleansing, right? And so what they would do is they would burn the whole animal with the blood and everything in it. So what I want you to see about this water is that it has blood in it. Because all things, according to the book of Hebrews, is that everything is cleansed with blood. Why? Because it's all a type and a foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrifice. And so they burn the whole animal with the blood in it. Now they have this big old mound of ashes, whatever they keep it in. And whenever they're ready to make some more purification, wanted to take a little tincture, a little pinch, they put it in there. They swirl it around. That stuff lasts for hundreds of years. And then they go around and they sprinkle it in there. But see, Ezekiel's talking like five, six hundred years uh, before Jesus is ever going to come. And it's a promise of the new covenant. So the Holy Spirit speaking to the prophet, he says, in the future, I'm going to sprinkle the water of purification on you, and you're going to be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you, next verse, and I'm going to give you a new heart. Yes. I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit I'm going to put in you, and I will remove the heart of stone out. You see, there's a heart surgeon working right here. I'm going to remove the heart of stone out. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Because, see, I can't work with a heart of stone. I want to work with a heart of flesh. I want something that's pliable. I want something that's malleable. I want something that's going to let me work and form and fashion. Because I need, in the new covenant, I want to form and fashion you into the image of my son. I want you to quit looking like the first Adam. And I want you to start looking like the last Adam. And it's only a work if you allow my hands to do the work in you and to form and fashion you, Romans 8 and 29, into the image of my son. So he says, and I will put my spirit in you. That's new covenant talk right there, my friend. That's new birth talk right there. The, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and, and you will be careful to obey my rules. Yes. See, it's a whole different thing when you begin to understand yes. in the new covenant that the power source is him yes. and it's not you. That's right. And we got to learn how to yield to that and trust in that. And, and listen, and we can't just ignore it when it's not working. It's not it's not the fault of the word and it's not the fault of Jesus. Amen. It's us. Amen. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Lord, help us. Amen. Amen. But when we learn to yield, yeah, so I wanted you to understand the new creation. I wanted you to understand being renewed through the knowledge, the experiential knowledge of who you are in Christ. And this is an ongoing work. And there's nothing better. I, I hate to say it. Again, I'm not promoting it. There's nothing better than a hiccup. There's nothing better. Listen to me. Yesterday, I'm coming back from Homa and I'm driving where that little thing is by the, uh, that boulevard, Victor 2 Boulevard by the post office, where they got that median section. And I'm telling you right now, every single time I go to that section, I'm looking to the right three different times. Why? Because one time I didn't, and I got broadsided by a car and ran into a fire hydrant. Experiential knowledge that there's a tree right there, and there could be a car coming around there, and I need to look a little bit closer. Whenever you get broadsided and you get hit, I'm here to tell you right now, it's going to help you remember the next time to pick experiential knowledge. And God uses that kind of stuff in your life. Yes. So I want to encourage you because he wants to, he wants to, he loves you. Yes. Yes. He wants to break you down so he can build you back up. Yes. <laughs> He's not going to leave you broken. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. That's good. So he wants us to, in verse four, he says he has granted to us his precious and very great promise. So that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful yes, desire. Yes. You've become a partaker of the divine nature. Now listen, I want you to, I'm not trying to get all fancy on you, but the word partaker, let's just keep the Greek out of it. It means to be a partner or a sharer. And so I used to draw this a lot. You see this new position. You live in this new, you live in this new place right here. And you're in Christ. He's divine. Amen. His nature is divine. 
And now we're going to just draw like a little umbilical cord, okay? <laughs> That's what we're going to do. Because, see, you're in him. Yeah. And you're growing in him. Mm. And, and, and you're being formed into his image. Yes. And you're connected to him. And now you become a partaker. You and him have become one. See, in Adam, you were born with a sinful nature. That's right. But in Christ, you're born again and you become a partaker of the divine nature. Yeah. That means that the power of God is flowing in you. Amen. That means that the power of God is, is, is strengthening you. Yeah. That means that the power of God is changing you. Yeah. Amen. And you got to understand that. You got to believe that. <coughs> I can't make you believe it. I can tell you about it. I can get excited about it because I've experienced. But, but we got to be able to learn it and we got to be able to believe it. Amen. And we got and listen, if we don't feel like we understand it, and we don't feel like it's working in our life, we need to cry out. Yeah. We need to cry out to the Lord and we need to say, Lord, I need that in my life because your word says this is this is truth. Amen. Because we need something that's gonna that's gonna be be real. We need something that's gonna that's gonna help us where the rubber meets the where the rubber meets the road. Amen? Right. All right. So now that we understand that we're a new creation, now that we understand that the that we've become the, the partakers of the divine nature, amen, I, I want to just kind of like go into a few of these words because what he said was now, see, you're not, you're, you're not adding to your faith for righteousness. You're not earning righteousness with God. You understand that Jesus is your righteousness, but now you're working with the Holy Spirit and you're adding these things to your faith because when it's all said and done, see the same image that Peter saw on the mountain when he saw the glory come out of him. When you and I work with the Holy Spirit in these things. No, this is important. Okay, this is important whenever you're in that conversation at work and yes. somebody gets on your nerves. Right. This is important when you're in a relationship with somebody and they get on your nerves. Yeah, yeah. This is important whenever you're engaging in real world activity and somebody does something to you that you don't like what they did to you. And your response doesn't look like you're Jesus. Instead, your response looks like your father, Adam, whatever that looks like. Your old man. Right? This is real stuff right here. What I need to tell you is, is that true believers are without excuse. Now, I don't mean that to beat you down. I'm preaching to the preacher. We have access to grace. We've been changed on the inside. And now Peter's saying, now you're supposed to work with the Holy Spirit and let him do the work in you and through you. Amen. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen from this side? Hallelujah. Praise God, I need a little bit of help. Can I get an amen from this side? Amen. 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 We want to look like Jesus, right? Yes. I want to look like Jesus. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Help us. Yes. Lord. Amen. All right. So the first thing is virtue. The, the, the first thing was virtue, and this is the word virtue right here. Behavior showing high moral standards. Moral goodness in thought and action. Moral goodness in thought and action. So, you know, I, I'm just, you know, what, I mean, what do we think about, right? I mean, it's, I'm preaching to the preacher. What do we think about? Okay, so what I need you to understand, though, is this. Well, how do I change my thought? You're, you're a partaker of the divine nature. If your thoughts are constantly not what they should be, you need to understand that the Holy Spirit, if, you, if we will yield to him and trust that we're new creations in Christ, see, and that he's already won the victory for us and believe that, amen. And yes, it's all, we need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need to pray in other tongues, praise God. We need to read the scripture. We need to renew our mind. But the point is this, is that Jesus has already done the work and we submit to his work and we yield to him. And when we do that, he begins to change the inside. He puts the new heart in. He begins to, to do the work. But it's not only your thoughts, it's also your action. But a lot of times it's got to come with your thoughts first. You know, right? I mean, I've seen that in my own life. You know, you're driving down the road. You're driving down the road. And look, this is one of my famous things. I think I taught my nephew this too. It wasn't a good thing that I taught him. And I'm like, this is what I do to them when they do that, bro. And 
No, that you think eh, like you know, it's probably five minutes long. Eh, 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 it just keeps on the horn for five to ten minutes. Praise God, I haven't done that in five years, ten years. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I used to say, I horned them good today, you know. Uh, but, but, but what I'm trying to say is, I thank God that He freed me in that area. Like somebody cut in front of me, and even if I got a slap on the brakes, I'm like, I don't really expect a whole lot different. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at? I didn't get in the wreck, thank you, Jesus. Uh, you know, and I don't really expect a whole lot different. Everybody knows people drive crazy. Praise God, I'm not going to lose my salvation over it. I'm not going to get irritated over it. By the grace of God, I'm going to thank, thank you, Jesus. I'm okay. Hallelujah! But, you know, and, and you get the point. That's just one action. Okay? There's so many actions. Somebody says something to me in a certain way. I'm still working on this. What's that? Yeah, I sing this song a lot. Right? He's still working on me. But whenever people say something to me a certain way, <clears throat> And then all of a sudden, you know, thank God I don't, I don't, I don't how's it going? I don't smoke, cuss, I don't dip, I don't chew, and I don't go with girls that do, praise God. <laughs> but I don't cuss no more, amen, but I'll get irritated with you. you if you push the right button, you'll know it. Because I, I, my voice, my tone of voice changes, or my demeanor looks different. So if you know how to press my button and you do it on purpose, that's your bad. You better check your own heart. Come on. Right. Amen. Pray, okay. pray for the pastor. <laughs> but, but I'm trying to use myself as an example because y'all know that y'all deal with the same kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and, and what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this gospel message says that we've been, we've received a, a, become a partaker of the divine nature and we have the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in us and that he will transform our thoughts and he will transform our actions if we will work with him. He's given us the power to do it is what I'm trying to tell you. Now he's asking us to work with him, to add, to supplement with effort. That's, what, that's how the Greek scholar said it. To supplement with all effort to add these things to the faith that you have already received. The faith that gives you power. The faith that gives you grace. Add to it. Amen? Amen. I thought this was really interesting. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. We're not going to go through all of them this morning. Praise God. 1 Peter 2 9. And, and, and you know what? You can turn to it, but I'm just going to kind of read it out of the King James, and that way you don't have to, unless you're already there. <laughs> he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now, I don't really have time to break down peculiar, but I got to tell you, it doesn't mean weird, it means that you're different. That's right. Amen. That's a simple five version. You're different than the world around you. But what I wanted you to see is the word praises is the same exact word as virtue in the Greek language. It's the same. So basically what it's saying right there, the, the translators use the word praise instead of virtue. But what they're saying is, is that you as a separated and different people show forth the praises of God when you respond to this untoward generation with virtue, with moral goodness, with a moral standard that is different than them. That means if you're a man and you work in a place where other men gather and men are talking the way that men talk, that means you don't talk the way they talk. That means you don't laugh at their dumb jokes because their jokes are worldly and it don't matter whether it's locker room talk, you don't live in that world anymore and you don't talk the way they do. That's right. And no matter how alpha male they are and how cool you think you could be, if you could throw a little something, something up in there and make everybody else laugh. No, you're not to be part of that because you are a new. See, that's what I'm trying to talk about. This true Christianity is something different than the world around you. And you can sit in a church with a bunch of people and they're all like, well, I, okay, no. That's, that's the world. This is new creation in Christ. And it's not just men that talk like that. <laughs> Especially not nowadays. Okay, Lord help us. So if you're a woman and you talk like that, because like oh, I think back in the day you said, you want to come with me to the powder room, girl? <laughs> no, they're not really going to have to go to the bathroom. They're ready to go talk. 
about whatever they're going to talk about. I've never been in there, so I don't really know what they talk about. But I'm just trying to say, it ain't just me. Lord changes. And so, isn't that good, though? Whenever we respond different than the world, we're actually giving him praise. We're giving him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Right. All right. Second thing is knowledge. We already talked about it. Gnosis means knowledge. Now, look, you can have knowledge about rocket science. You can have knowledge about PlayStation. You can have knowledge about, I don't even know if they play, play Xbox. Or you can have knowledge about football. That's not the knowledge he's talking about. He's talking about the knowledge of God based upon what God has given us in the truth. So it starts with gnosis, informational knowledge. That's what that word is right there. In order to truly understand God, you do have to put some information yes. into your heart. The English word for knowledge was used five times in the first eight verses of what we read. And so it's only that one time right here that it's the word gnosis. Every other time it's that epic gnosis. It's that experiential, that fuller understanding. But until you can get to the fuller understanding, you got to put the, some knowledge in. You understand what I'm trying to say? I hope you're with me. But look, there's a danger with this. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse one. I got the ESV here, but you can. He says, "Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge." He says, "This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up." Yeah. <laughs> so the knowledge of so when you start learning the real knowledge of God, number one, there's to be a danger. And believe me, I unfortunately I have experienced this, and I hope that I'm not still walking in this. But look, you can gain knowledge, and then before you know it, you get you're puffed up. Mm. And every, and I'm not the only one in here that's had that problem either. Amen. Okay, so so you can gain knowledge, and then but it's not mixed with love. And so now you become puffed up and you start to feel some kind of special way about yourself. All right. But see, the Lord knows how to bring us down. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says pride comes and then the fall. That's yeah. right. the, our father that loves his son chases his son. He's not going to let Matt stay in the wrong spot. He's not going to let you stay in the wrong spot. If you belong to him, he loves you and he's going to help bring you down. Right, and then now that becomes experiential knowledge. Mm. See, it's like I don't want to go back there again. Just like I don't want to not look twice to the right when I'm passing through that median. I don't want to go there. Again. Yes, yes, I want my heart to be humble yes. before yes. the Lord. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. So the third <coughs> thing I want to share with you this morning is self-control. Mm. The definition is the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. So this, this verse right here, in, at least the way the word was used in the Greek during the time frame of the, when the apostles wrote these letters, was directly related to sensuality. The idea is continence. Okay, but but listen, self-control is, is a fruit of the spirit, right? So in Galatians, you don't have to turn to it, but Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Temperance is another word for self-control. Yeah. So it's a fruit of the spirit, but we've already covered that because you're a new creation in Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in you. And you become a partaker of the divine nature, right? But now, but see, in order for the fruit of the Spirit to come out of you, you have to, I didn't tell you all the name of the word, it's a, it's a point of evil word. You have to joint participate with the Holy Spirit. So that means that when, okay, for instance, when you're driving down the road and the person cuts in front of you, you, you may, your, your immediate reaction in the past would have been hit the horn, but now, it's like, I'm not going to hit that horn because it's not going to do any good. It's just flesh. So I don't hit the horn. And instead, I slow down and I let that person take off. And, it's, and I'm good. Yes. I'm good. Yes. See, that's just one example. 
There's multiple examples. Now, whenever somebody used to be sassy to me or say something to me that got me, got me thrown off, instead of me responding sassy back, praise God, come on, I can... I can be kind. I'm, you know, I'm still working on that one, but I believe that the man look the last two to three days. I feel like the Lord's been speaking to my heart, and so look, if y'all get sassy with me in the future, now listen, you can't. Yeah. We're gonna test it, brother. Yes, sir. I know you will. I know you will. <laughs> but look, this is the thing. You can't do it like this. Yeah. It can't be like you're sassy to me, and then I'm like, you know, because that's not real. That's that's a facade. Right. Or, or you know, somebody says something to you the wrong. Oh, I know, brother. Right. Yeah, you're. No, no, I'm not talking about that because see, that's our improper motive. I'm talking about something real. Yeah. I'm yeah. talking about a fruit of the spirit yeah. inside of your heart. See, he he's growing you up. You done been broadsided a couple times. You fell into a couple of ditches. You fell on your face a couple of times, and the goodness of God picked you up. And, and now the goodness of God, amen, is ministering to you, and he's working on you, and you're letting him do a work in your heart. Yeah. Praise God, and the love of God now is starting to have its way in you. Yeah. And I don't even want to waste time on getting sassy back. Right. Because then I'll feel weird. Y'all yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. No, really. Somebody acts weird to you, and then you respond, and dude, be careful too, because if you open your mouth and you let too much come out, it's all, I don't know about you, maybe you don't have that problem. I can't stop it. <laughs> I mean, it used to be I couldn't stop it because something takes. See, I learned to look. I'm, I'm, I'm not going through all of them tonight, but I, I learned a lesson when the Lord first got a hold of me way back whenever that happened, 2002, probably. Danielle and I went to a third day concert in New Orleans. Today. I think I still remember it like it was yesterday. We had a gray Windstar van, and we pulled up at. The group, what is it called? The groovy mushroom pizza place or some kind of weird mushroom <laughs> pizza place. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay. And so we pulled up, I don't remember what it's called. Magic, I don't know what it's called. Anyway, right there. That's probably why the Lord was probably telling us to get out of there. Uh, Mellow mushroom or something like that. Anyway, we pulled up, and I don't even know what happened. I don't know what she said, but whatever she said was a button presser. And I'm not saying she was trying to press my button. I'm just saying she pressed my button. <laughs> but for the first time in my life, I wow. recognized it. Ooh. I had become a more spiritual man. <laughs> and I was like, what is this I feel in here? Because it don't feel good. And I gripped the steering wheel and I said, Danielle, you need to pray for me. <laughs> I feel something that isn't right. And she laid her hands on me and we went yes. in there and ate pizza yes. and, you know, old man Matt didn't show up on that night. And you know, and praise God. And you know what happened? Amen. It's all good. And you know what happened was about a day, two days later, I said, what was that? And I got into Galatians chapter 5 and I realized it was a lust of the flesh and it's called wrath. And, yes, and, yes. and look, and demons love that little spot because yes. it's in you. It's already in you because if it's a lust of the flesh, it's in you, yep. right? And them demons over there tickling that stuff, yep. and they're trying to like get it out of you. And then once it starts flowing, it's like, man, man, you know, you just like just let it all come out. Uh -huh. It's just ugly, ugly. Don't look nothing like Jesus. Right. And Lord, help you. Be one. It's not good to do it in front of your wife. It's not good, men. Don't do that in front of your wife. Right. Don't do that. That's right. Don't don't act like that. Okay, but what I'm saying is it's kind of bad too whenever you do it in front of the world. Yes, yes, yes. Might even be worse because Daniel's yes. like, hey, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. I ain't going to go run around telling everybody how you act sometimes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Lord, the, when we do it in front of the world, yes. she's trying to protect me, but they ain't trying to protect me. They're trying to make me look bad. That's Come right. on. That's somebody right. help me out. Amen. Yeah. I'm telling That's you the right. truth. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So temperance or self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. It means that His fruit is produced in you and it's reflected out of you. Mm. Amen. Yet the very way that self is included means that self has to partner in the process. As a matter of fact, the very thought of what Peter is saying in all of this is that it is us through the Spirit that are supplying these things to our faith. In these instances, we are consciously working with the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to work in us. Yeah. And through us. One more, one more story about Pastor Matt and about the change. 
we were going, and I've told this story before, but we were getting ready to go to Florida many, many years ago. And it was after the Lord had started working on me. Praise God. And I understood better the gospel. Okay, let's just put it that way. And there was a flag system. And I think that once the flag was up blue, it means that it was time for shots. So it means I was already in the room. Because sometimes I've seen so many pages, I don't even know where I am. So they got these flags up. So all my pages are done. See a blue flag? Destined time. Put the keys in the pocket, walking down the hallway, get in the car, about to pull out. And all of a sudden I get a text. You got a patient in room one. What? They had the wrong flag. <laughs> now I'm going to throw that. So I walk back in there and I walk in and I take my keys out of my pocket and I throw them across the thing on the desk. And, and, and Miss Judy, really, really sweet Miss Judy, remember she taught you how to make that coconut cake? Okay. And, and, and I saw that patient and then I walk, I walk out the thing down the hallway and the Holy Spirit said, boy, that was something right there. How do you do that? You need to go back in there and tell that woman that you're sorry. I didn't even, wasn't even doing it and I didn't even know she was standing there but she saw me. I said, I said, Lord, I, I got to go back in there and say, he said, you like my presence? <laughs> you like having a relationship with me? Yeah. You need to go back in there and you need to tell that woman that you're sorry. Jeez. Look how you acted. Yes, yes, Lord. So I did. And you know what? That was probably one of the easiest things in the world. Mm. I, I walked in there. I said, Dude, I'm sorry. You know, the Lord, I got halfway down the hall. I said the truth. I got halfway down the hall in the hall because she knew I'm a Christian. Right. I'm over there talking Jesus 24-7. And then I throw my keys across the hallway. Yeah. I'm like, you know what, Miss Judy, I messed up, man. The Holy Spirit got on my back, dude. And I was like, I couldn't deal with it. I had to come back over here. She's like, I didn't think you were I wasn't doing it to you, Miss Judy. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I, I did something I wasn't supposed to do. And she's like, well, praise God, have a good vacation. <laughs> you know? Amen. You know, so that's temperance, that's self-control, it's the fruit of the spirit, but what and, and but in order for that fruit to come out, we gotta work with it. Amen. That's you right, get the point. Right. Praise God. So good. Good. Look at 2 Corinthians 13 and 14. I'm just gonna read it to you out the amplified. Can you figure out how to put the amplified up there? Now look, I know y'all thinking, man, I never knew Pastor Matt use all these different translations. I use these different translations to try to get an idea. I've got to be honest with you, the Amplified Bible, I don't even really consider a true translation. It's more of a commentary. But I'll look at five different things to try to see what the Holy Spirit's really saying here. The grace, favor, and spiritual blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence and fellowship, the communion and sharing together and participation in the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So be it. Mm. Joint participation with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Isn't that good? Yes. Praise God. That's a, that's what that's what they're saying. Look, in the King James, it's, it's it's translated communion of the Holy Spirit. In the newer translations, it's it's translated the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We're fellowshipping yes. with the Holy Spirit. We're a partaker of the divine nature. He's flowing in us. He's flowing out of us. We're letting him use us as a vessel of light in the midst of a darkened world. We're letting the Holy Spirit form Christ in us. And now Christ is coming out of us. And the world is getting to see a true representation of the Son of God. That's a good thing. Yes. Amen. It says in James chapter 4 verse 7, because we're talking about how this... Um, this, this works. He says in the King James, I'll just read it. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yes. Yeah, I want you to see that part about submit yourselves therefore to God. Okay, because that goes back to Colossians 3.10. He didn't say for you to take matters in your own hands. He didn't say for you to try to work it out in your own strength. If you're going to submit to, if you're going to submit yourself to God, then you have to understand that God is the power source. Yeah. You have to understand that this is how God works. You're not going to pick this thing up and do it in your own strength. Does that make sense what I'm trying to tell you? You're not going to muscle through this thing. You're going to learn to depend on the work of God in your life. And you're going to learn how to yield yourself to you. Amen. And that when you yield to his plan. So what are you trying to say? We're talking about resist. We're trying to get the devil to flee from us. Right? That's what the scripture is talking about. Some people are like, man, the devil's been on my back. Right? 
Okay, and, and the scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. No, it doesn't. It says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, how do I resist? How do I resist the devil? You submit yourself to God. Yes. Well, how do I submit myself to God? You understand that he has a plan. What's his plan? He, you, he killed your old man and he resurrected a new man. Yes. And, and as you yield to that, the grace of the Holy Spirit is flowing. In other words, it's like this. Father, I can't do it. Yeah. Amen. I can't do it. Yes. I've been trying to do it and I can't do it. And even though I thought I knew I couldn't do it, obviously I didn't know as much as I thought I knew that I couldn't do it. And so now I'm coming to you and I'm telling you, I can't do it. I need you. Yes. I need you to help me. Yes. Hey, you know, I need you to work on me. I need to humble myself under the presence of God. You don't have to humble yourself to me. That's right. That, it's not necessary for you to humble. Look, I, I told somebody the story the other day. I told y'all about two years ago, I was watching this series called Vex Whatever. And it was about parenting. Mm -hmm. And I thought to my, I just all my life thought I was the best daddy ever. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be real with you. I'll be honest with you. I didn't think I was the best husband. I'm not proud of that either, but I just thought I was the best daddy. Mm -hmm. And as I'm watching this video, I'm realizing that me not being the best husband made me not be the best dad. Yes, yes, that's right. And as I'm watching this, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts dealing with my heart. And, and, I, and I started to, I started to, I had to press pause and I was like, Lord, forgive me. Mm -hmm. Lord, you know, and I, and I did. I sat there and I repented and I thought that, and then I cry, okay, I'm, I'm good. Let me wipe my eye. All right, let me finish this video because this is good. You know, he's telling me about myself. Okay, <laughs> press start again and finish the video. Oh, Lord. Thought I was done. Mm. Felt this overwhelming desire to get out of my bed and get on, get on my knees, right? And so now I'm on my knees. And as soon as I hit my knees, I told you all this, but y'all may not remember. <laughs> as soon as I got to my knees, I heard the voice of the Lord lower. <laughs> And when I heard that, my first reaction was almost like a junk, junk, well, maybe not a junk, he's kind of tough. But if somebody else would have told me, I said lower, how I would have responded. Oh, a square down shoulder, right? And for a split second, that's what I kind of felt. And I was like, what are you doing, son? The father's telling you lower. And this is what I said, yes, sir. And I got on my face. And as I was on my face, I started to convulse. And I started to weep. And I started to cry. And the more I cried and the more I wept and the more I convulsed, the more I convulsed, the more I wept, the more I cried, and the more I started to feel the burden lift off of me because I couldn't change all those past years. But I could get my heart right with the Lord and I could say, Lord, I'm sorry because I thought that I had something figured out, but I didn't. And now I need you to heal it, Lord. I need you to heal it because you're my healer. And you're, you're the only one that I can hope in. I need you to do something, Lord. Amen. And if we can get to that, is there something wrong with me lowering myself before the, the God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth and all that in them is? The one that scattered the stars in the sky, breathed life into a lump of clay? No, I, that's where I need to be. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He said, I resist the proud, but I give grace yes. to the humble. Yes. Yes. It's a beautiful place to be. Humble yourself, therefore, into the mighty hand of God. Yes. Pick you back up. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. I think we're going to stop with this one. This last one right here. Number four. Steadfastness. Uh, sometimes it's translated as patience. The word means endurance. The definition means the quality of being resolutely unwavering and firm endurance. Many that have been with us in the church for a while recognize the Greek word hupomone. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of those Greek words that's a compound word. Okay? Hupomone. It means hupo, mone. So the most literal way would be under, remain. That's the most literal rendition right there. Under, remain. Remain under. Mm. This woman you gave me, Lord. Under, 
remain. <laughs> this man you gave me, Lord, under, remain. My word says, under, remain. Mm. I'm in this trial. I don't like this job. Okay. You remain under yeah. until I tell you mm. something different. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Unless, unless he's telling you something different. Amen. He does speak like that. He'll say, now it's time. Or you shouldn't have done that to begin with. You shouldn't have went over that. How many times have we, look, I don't have time to get into all those stories where Pastor Matt almost made the wrong decision. Okay. We make wrong decisions, but that's why we need to get a, get in front of it on the front end and be like, Lord, what is your will in this situation? So when you find yourself in situations, see, because Jesus Jesus didn't quit halfway up Calvary. Amen? Yeah, yeah. Under remain. I do what I hear my father. I say what I hear my father say. I do what I see my father do. It, it, he said, no man takes my life from me. He's given me permission to lay my life down and to pick it up again. And then he remained under the trial in a way that honored God. And that's what you and I are to do. Remain under the trials of life in a way that honors God. And when we do that, we start to learn. And, he, and it's in those times that he's forming and fashioning us. He's strengthening us. He's, a, he's teaching us. Yes. He's giving us experiential knowledge. Yes. Amen. I put some hard things in here. I'm going to go ahead and read them. <laughs> you know, sometimes... And, and, and I guess it's, it's safe for me to read it because I, because some of this stuff has to do with me. Some of it doesn't. But you know everything, and you can't get along with anybody. And it's patterns in your life. Switch spouses every couple of years. Switch jobs every couple of years. Switch churches every couple of years. And the point that I'm trying to make is that if a vessel is going to be refined in a fire, it has to stay in the furnace. Yes. Amen. You can't just now again. Let me be clear on this. Yes, there's times that God moves us. Amen, amen. And we're not supposed to move till we know that he's moving us. Amen. 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 You know, if you're going to be refined, you got to stay in the furnace. And if a branch is going to be pruned, it has to stay still. Yep. <laughs> you can see that branch moving around like, I don't want that pruning shears on me. <laughs> don't cut that off. That's going to hurt me. Amen. Jesus endured the persecution during his ministry. I believe he was hurt whenever people left. You remember that story where he said, uh, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Mm. And then they all left. Yeah. And it's like, you, you would think at that moment, you'd be like, okay, Lord, this is like a real touchy time right here. But like, you got to really be careful about what you say right here, Jesus. Because, I mean, the crowd just left. And he turns to his disciples and says, you going to leave me too? Mm. See, I believe that it hurt him because he knew that meant the greatest act of love that the earth was ever going to see. He had to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Mm. He was going to offer his life for the sins of the world. And so many people didn't want to eat that food. The whole story starts with them coming all the way across to the other side because he had fed their bellies. They wanted the food that they wanted, but they didn't want the food that he was offering. Mm. And how that must have hurt his heart. Because yes. he's like, hmm, I'm, about to, I'm about to hang neck on the cross. I'm about to take a beating, and I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it so that you can have eternal life. I'm, I'm doing it so that you can have a new life, and they just, they just turned on him, and they just, and they just left. I think that the apostle Paul, I think of the apostle Paul a lot when he was writing Second Timothy in the dark, cold, and wet dungeon in Rome in the Mamertine prison. I'm talking about endurance right now. Because see, sometimes when you're going through things and people treat you wrong, what you don't even realize is that if you allow bitterness to get into your heart, yeah. Yeah. it'll make you want to quit. Yeah. You can't, you got, I don't know, I keep been talking about this a lot lately, but you gotta protect your heart. Mm -hmm. Your heart is the place where that belongs to the Lord. Yeah. And I think of Paul, and I just think, man, what, if, what it would have been had he done all that he did 
And then in that last moments of his life, he would have quit. I mean, because listen, if you read 2 Timothy, do that for your homework. This is what he says in, in 2 Timothy 4, 10 through 11. He says, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. Cretans went to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. This is the part that got me. Take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for me. The reason that that touches me is because, see, if you don't know the story, it doesn't mean a lot. But if you know the story, you realize that the Apostle Paul wouldn't bring Mark on the second missionary journey because, because something happened in the first one and Mark and Paul was ready to give up on it. And, it, and, it, and Paul's like, son, you ain't ready for missionary work yet. You, you drug up on the last trip. I need to be able to depend on you. And it caused a division to the point where Barnabas, Mark's uncle, took him with him, but God, like the masterful craftsman he is, made a new team out of Paul and Silas and a new team out of Barnabas and Mark, and, and he just even increased it. But now here's Paul, years later, and he's had time to think about this. And, and he's heard the story about young Mark and how he turned into a man of God, amen? And how he's doing the work in the ministry. Hallelujah. And now he's stuck in this dungeon. Uh, it, uh, that's what it is. It's a hole in the ground in Rome. You can still see it. It's a cold, wet dungeon. And, and he tells Timothy, he said, man, bring the cloak, bring the parchments, try to get here before the winter, okay? But, and bring Mark with you if you can. You know, and, and I just Amen. It, it, praise God. He, he endured. Yes, he man. endured the trial. I mean, what kind of stuff are we going through? Look, I'm not making light of it, but I'm just trying to say, man, when we put it in in the scheme of things, let us, Lord, help us to stay true to your will and, and to do the, to the, to do the work that you called us to. Amen. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. I was laying in my bed and I kind of started, I knew I was going to get emotional when I read that because I started crying in my bed when I was studying it, when I thought about that, about it, what an amazing journey of a life, how amazing the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in a vessel that remains under and yields to the correction of the Holy Spirit. You know, whenever we're going through these things in our lives and we're dealing with certain things in our lives. Praise God. And we allow Him to have His way. So I don't know if you're going through something today. If you are, I want to pray with you. I'm just going to ask them to play a song. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord. Maybe we can pray to the Lord. Ask Him to help us to add these things to our life. Amen. That He would have His way in our life. That we would bring Him glory. We give You glory, Lord. Yeah.